and make a joyful noise to our King. Amen. Harvest. 
Saints. Good morning. Good morning. Jesus is alive and he is risen. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome. We're so glad that you're here today, this morning. My name is Carlos Ertech. I'm a member here at Harvest, and we're so honored that you would worship with us this morning. You can grab a seat. Uh, we just have a, a few announcements for you today. Um, uh, the first one is, uh, if this is your first time here, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, there is a Connect card in the seat pocket in front of you, and if this is your first time here, we would love for you to fill that out, and in there you can um, indicate just ways that we can serve you and pray for you, and you can give that uh, Connect card to anyone with a lanyard or put it in the uh, box in the back. Um, and, uh, and then uh, if you want to follow along and, and hear all the announcements, all the events that we have coming up here at Harvest, uh, there's a QR code, um, and you can uh, scan that, or you can go to the app, and it'll uh, show you all the announcements that we have going on. But uh, one of the uh, things that we're really excited for here at Harvest is Kids Camp. Yeah, who's excited for that? Awesome. We've got Kids Camp coming up. Save the date, June 17th through the 21st from 6 to 8.30 p.m. Uh, it's open to any child uh, age four years old through students entering the fifth grade uh, in the fall of 2024. So any questions about that, go see Veronica. Um, and if you wanna sign up, you can do that online or in the app, but it is gonna be an amazing, amazing time. So please, uh, yeah, have your child participate, be a part of that. Uh, next Sunday, uh, April 14th, we're gonna be having step one. Um, after uh, the service, and step one is just a really great place. Uh, if you are new here, to, newer here to Harvest, uh, we would love for you to attend that, and it's a great place to hear more about the church, our vision, uh, and get a chance to meet the different uh, pastors and staff. Uh, it's going to be happening outside, weather permitting, uh, so please come to that. And then uh, we're going to be having a students' hangout tonight. Uh, here at the church from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, so if you have a child from 6th to 12th grade, we would love to see them there. Uh, Harvest, we are uh, really just thankful and grateful for your uh, just kindness and generosity in your giving. And uh, today, if you consider uh, Harvest your church home, we would uh, love to invite you to continue to give of your tithes and offerings. And again, you can do that through many different ways. There's a box in the back via text, online or in the app as well. All right, friends, well, let me just pray for the rest of our worship service this morning. Father God, we uh, just give you all the praise and all the glory. Lord God, we thank you that we can um, just gather here this morning and lift uh, just your name on high, Father, uh, as, as we sing that um, your son Jesus is alive, that he is risen and he is reigning. Lord God, we celebrated that last Sunday and, and today we continue to celebrate that because that changes everything. And so, Father God, we pray as we continue to sing songs to you and as we listen to the preaching of your word, Lord God, that you would just move in our hearts and move in our lives, that you would change us, that you would transform us into the people that you're calling us to be. Be glorified this morning, Jesus. In the powerful name of your son, we pray. Amen. My sorrow and dead in my sin. I'm lost without hope, no place to begin. But your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, in my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, is over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. Release from my chains. 
chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a Rejoice, so heaven and love. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. Yes, he did. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, that's when death was arrested and my life began. Chapter 2 says this of our story that God has told, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And that, that's all of us. We, we were a part of that, and yet Last week, we got to celebrate the work that Jesus has done on our behalf, that he conquered death through his cross, and he rose from the dead in victory over sin. And we celebrated that, but just like Carlos said, we, we don't just celebrate that one Sunday a year. It's not something we just put in our back pocket after Easter's done, and we, we think of that as on a, a nice, nice Sunday in uh, the beginning of spring. But that's, that's our story, right? This is, this is our story every single day, every week that Jesus Christ has conquered, that he uh, died for our sins, that he rose from the dead. And so Ephesians 2 continues and says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved 
and raised us with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. This is our God that we worship every day. And may we give him glory. Remember those walls that we called sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we called death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came. He died and he rose. And those giants are dead now. Yes, this is our God. This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross. Jesus, who pulled me out of that pit? He did, he did. Who paid for all of our sin? Nobody but Jesus. Who rescued me from that grave? Yahweh, Yahweh. Who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but Jesus. we realize that today you are the king seated on the throne that you alone reign over all things and are in control of all things and in you all hold all things hold together and 
And thank you, thank you, thank you for the work that you have accomplished through Jesus that we celebrated last week and we continue to celebrate today. Jesus Christ, you died for our sins, taking our punishment on yourself. And yet you did not stay dead, but you rose in victory over death. And then you ascended to the right hand of the Father in glory. We remember these truths because this is what we are worshiping every single week. We worship our King, Jesus. We worship our Savior who has done the work on our behalf so that we can come before our Father. And so we give all glory and honor to you alone, Jesus. We, we submit ourselves to the Word and to the work of the Spirit in our hearts so that you can do what only you can, which is change us to be more like our Savior, Jesus. And so we ask that you would do that today. And we pray these things in the name of our King Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God for who he is and what he's done. We love to worship him. We love to do that together. We love family worship. But kiddos and teachers, you are now dismissed to go to your classroom this morning. And uh, praise God for how he's working and growing disciples of all ages here at Harvest. And um, praise God for what he's doing. We're going to continue our series um, in the Gospel of John. So if you want to get a head start, John chapter 8 is where we're going to be today after taking one week break to dive into Matthew last week. But John 8, and whether this is your first time here or you've been here many, many times, uh, we are your, fa your family here. We're so thankful that you are here and you are, you are loved here. And um, uh, we want to, we're excited about all that God is doing. Praise God for a special weekend last weekend, amen? A great Good Friday service, a great Easter service. And honestly, just to want to share some really encouraging news with you. Last Sunday's Easter service was the highest attended service ever in our church. So praise God for that. And it's not, it's not it, yeah, praise God. Um, and it's not about numbers. It's about names. It's about the opportunity to see God impact and change lives uh, today and, and for eternity. And it's about God providing the hope for freedom for all of us. Not just some of us, but all of us, as we're going to see in the text today. Um, the message is entitled, Do You Want to Be Free? And that's the question from John 8 that Jesus is really asking us. The text is asking us. And he is not just asking, but offering us a pathway to freedom. But before we dive in, I have a, a question for you guys. Yeah. Who has a bucket list of like stuff you want to do like at some point in time, a place you want to go, an experience you want to have? Anybody have one of those things, right? All right, so on the count of three, I I'm curious because we want to get to know each other because we like each other here, okay? Uh, just, just speak out loud, shout out one of those things that you are is on your proverbial bucket list, okay? One, two, three. Awesome. Tyler, I had no idea you love boy bands so much. Um, for me, um, I've always wanted to go to Boston, and I've always wanted to walk the Freedom Trail. I haven't made it yet. My dad and I talked about that when I was in high school. Um, I haven't made it up there yet to do that, but the Freedom Trail is something that's always intrigued me. I'm, I love history. I love a good Nick Cage movie, um, National Treasure. Let's go search for all these things all over the country. Um, but in Boston, on the Freedom Trail, it's a two-and-a-half-mile journey with 16 or 17 stops about really important dates in our country's history and significant events that happened for our country to have their own freedom, to be independent of British rule, right? Taxation without representation, right? And the pursuit of religious freedom that came through independence and the Revolutionary War. And like the Freedom Trail in Boston leads you uh, on a journey to experience many landmarks and milestones in our country's history of experiencing and gaining and purchasing freedom from the British government. Today in the text in John chapter 8, Jesus is going to provide his own Freedom Trail for us today. The opportunity to experience freedom from, uh, from captivity from just putting our sufficiency or seeking sufficiency in things that will only destroy us and will never deliver us. And ultimately and definitively, freedom from the grasp of sin and Satan and death. Praise God, amen. And so we're going to see that in the text today. But there's one significant difference between when our country purchased, it got its freedom, and when how we experience freedom through Jesus. And that is this, that our country's desire for freedom was one of a pursuit of independence, our freedom through Jesus comes only through dependence on Jesus. 
uh, surrender and submission um, to the one who paid it all for us. Uh, Jesus today in the text is going to share with us directly the stark and sobering reality of our depravity and of our captivity to this thing called sin. And the reality of it, the, the dark reality of it, that if we do not do anything in terms of putting our faith in Jesus, if Jesus didn't come, then we were doomed to spend eternity separated from Jesus. But God, he worked in the middle of our captivity. He purchased our victory on the cross of Calvary. Praise God for that. And he offers us freedom today. He offers us freedom, um, and, but the reality is, uh, while well, freedom is a free gift to us, it, it costs Jesus everything. So the text today is asking us this genuine question, do you want to be free? Do you want to be free from the shackles of sin and death? Do you want to be free from the anxiety of this life and putting our hope in things that won't last or won't offer us hope? Do we want to be free from the, the hamster wheel of seeking our, our identity in the perception of others or the accomplishments or achievements and things that will never suffice? Do you want to be free? Sounds like a silly question. Anybody want to remain in bondage, right? Yeah, sign me up for captivity. Yay, right? Anybody would raise your hand for that? But we're going to see in the text that Jesus actually points out to some people that thought they were free, that they were actually not, and that they were choosing to remain in captivity. Is that your story today? Because there's only one pathway to freedom, and that's Jesus. Full surrender, full submission. The beauty and the power of the gospel is that no matter the fierceness of the battles inside you, the past that is haunting you, the opponent that is facing you, the thoughts that are plaguing you, the circumstances or obstacles that are surrounding you, freedom is available for you because Jesus made a way for you. Praise God. Amen. Here's the big idea today. You'll see it in the text. You'll see it on the screen. You'll see it in your notes that true freedom, like not fake freedom, true freedom comes through complete surrender to the Son of God and continual submission to the Word of God. True freedom, the path that Jesus is going to mark out for us and display to us and hand us a map for today in the text is this. It only comes to a complete surrender to the Son of God, Jesus, and continual submission to the Word of God. Jesus is offering you a pathway to freedom today. He's offering you freedom. He's offering you the opportunity to live forever with Him in eternity. The question is going to be, what say you? Because it responds, requires a response from us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I just pray that you would give us the courage and give us the humility to choose freely today, you. God, to choose to walk in freedom. God, so many of us entered into this place, whether we're online or in person, in captivity. In captivity, some stronghold, in captivity, some sin, some thought process, some pursuit that is temporal and temporary on this earth that is distracting us and ultimately destroying us. God, I pray that you would just squelch our pride. That you would reveal yourself beautifully to us as the freedom that you are so freely offering us. Father, minimize distractions and speak to our hearts the freedom that you have purchased for us and that you so freely offer us, so generously offer us. Give us the humility to see our captivity and give us the courage and the boldness to respond with faith with belief, with surrender, with submission, with obedience, joyfully, and seeing that in and through that, we can and li will live free indeed. Jesus, thank you for the gospel. Holy Spirit, convict and compel, encourage, exhort, as you promised to do. Lead us into your truth today, Jesus, and may the tr your truth set us free. And it's in your mighty name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Turn with me, if you would, to the Gospel of John. We're going to, the back part of John chapter 8 is where we're going we're gonna to be today. John 8, 31 uh, through 59. And so John says this. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered, And we are the offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Praise God. I know that you are the offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works that Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. 
This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's business and desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he has nothing to do with the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar, and he is the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. The Jews answered him, are, you, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? And Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we, have, now we see that you have a demon. Abraham died as did the prophets, yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? And Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him. I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and he was glad. So the Jews said to him, you are not 50 years old and you have seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and he went out of the temple. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. This is Jesus' freedom trail that he's offering us, and it's our freedom trail today. And as we've seen recently in our journey through John, before, the, before we, we took a moment's break for Easter, there was a back and forth dialogue happening that Jesus is not continuing here in John chapter 8 during the, the last day of the Temple of Booths, Temple of Shelters between Jesus and the religious leaders, and, and we saw that in John 7, we saw that in John 8, and Jesus is declaring continually his, the reality of his divinity. He is saying, as he did in John 7, I am the one that will quench what, the thirst that you have in John 8. I am the light that you need in your darkness. And he's proclaiming these hope-altering, eternity-giving words, grace-declaring words, so that people might choose to believe in him and receive eternal life through him. That's, again, remember the whole thesis of the Gospel of John is that we would believe that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God, and that by believing in him, we would have life in his name. And so Jesus is teaching and declaring his divinity so that people would put their trust and their faith in him, that they would surrender to him and live forever with Jesus for all of eternity. And praise God, as we look back at verse 30 of chapter 8, which is a verse preceding immediately our, our subset of verses today, that we saw that as Jesus taught... Many did believe in him. Praise God. Amen? That, that the gospel is powerful, that Jesus changes everything. And I pray that if you have not known Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that you would choose to believe today. That you would believe, that you would see, that you would believe. Because that changes everything for you. Now, however, there were still religious leaders in the gathering that did not believe Jesus. In fact, so much so that they, they despised Jesus. They were seeking to kill uh, Jesus. And so this is where we, we pick up in the middle of this tension in the beginning of verse 31 here. And so Jesus said to the Jews which had believed in him, he's talking to this crowd, he's talking specifically here to the ones who had just chosen to put their faith in Jesus. And he says these powerful, important words. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you what? Free. If you are truly my disciples, you see, Jesus is not after converts, just like we're not here at, at Harvest after converts. Converts are great, but the goal is disciples. The goal is disciples, not just to make an emotional decision or I feel good. No, it's what does it look like to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? It means that you fully and completely surrender and that you continually submit to his word. That's what it means to be a disciple. It's a lifelong journey in the same direction as Eugene Peterson likes to say. It's a journey that we're all on today. 
And so this verse 31 and 32 are paramount. So how do we know if we're truly my Jesus' disciples? Jesus tells us if we abide in his word. My friends, are you abiding in the word? You can say till you're blue in the face, I'm a disciple, I'm a disciple. That's not what the, the, the decides if you're a disciple. What declares if you're a disciple, what displays if you're a disciple is, are you abiding, remaining in the word of God? Are you remaining in the truth? Because that, are you surrendering? Are you submitting? That's what it means to abide, to remain in, to surrender, to put, come, put yourself under the authority of Jesus and under the authority of God's word and say, I'm going to live your way, no matter how I feel about it. And then when you abide in the word of God, guess what the word of God does? It teaches you the truth. You will know the truth. Truth is absolute. It's not relative, no matter what culture tries to tell you. Jesus and this, God's truth, is absolute. It's our compass. It's our due north. It describes and teaches us what we should do. And then when we know the truth, which comes from abiding in the truth, then guess what the truth does? It sets us free. Free from the captivity of trying to live the world's way or seek our affection or our sufficiency in the world or our satisfaction. It frees us from worrying about things like even death, right? Paul in Philippians 1. To live is Christ, to die is gain. How do you get there? By abiding in the word. By believing that Jesus is better. To live on earth is great. To be with Jesus in eternity is greater. And so these are paramount. It's the choice of daily surrender is, is abiding. Choice to daily submit to the word of God. And the word is not just the written word, although it is the written word. John 1.14, like uh, several weeks ago when we started this, we saw this. Remind us all here. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who's the word? Jesus. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the only son and the father, full of grace and truth. So the word logos is not just the written word of God, which it is. It is actually Jesus Christ, the revelation of God himself. So the question here is, are you abiding in Jesus, the person? Are you anchoring your hope? Are you surrendering to Jesus, remaining in Jesus? John 15, apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. And then are you abiding in his word? Are you submitting your heart, your life under the authority of God's word? What God says, I will do. Trusting that his word is better for us. And so that's really the heart of this whole passage. How do I get freedom? Through abiding in the word of God. And that's how he displays whether I'm a true disciple or not. Like, you will know a disciple by their fruits. Anchor in the word. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead you, to guide you. That's what Jesus is teaching us. That freedom, man, is possible for you today. Praise God, amen. In a world of our fake news, this is good news. And this is true. Freedom is possible. I don't care how much bondage you walked in here with. Freedom is possible for you. The power of the gospel is greater than the strongest addiction. It's, it's the grace of God covers your greatest sin from your past. Isn't that beautiful and amazing? But you have to choose to surrender. You have to choose to submit. You have to choose in response to God's grace to believe. Salvation doesn't come from what you do. Salvation comes through what Jesus has already done. Like Jesus says that himself in verse 36. So if the sun sets you free, right, then you'll be free indeed. Not if your good works set you free because they can't. Not if tithing more money sets you free because it won't. But only through Jesus. The religion can't save you. Jesus can save you. If the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. So freedom is possible from the shackles of shame and guilt, from the exhaustion of this hamster wheel. Freedom from the fear of man. The path is laid out for us by Jesus and men. And maybe you put your faith in the Lord a long time ago when you're here today and you like, you've wandered your heart and your life from submitting to the word of God daily. I pray that you would be encouraged to get back on that path to see that it's the best way for you. Jesus is paving a pathway to freedom. We're going to see three steps on this pathway to freedom. Imagine you're like Nick Cage, right? And you get this, you're, you're on this national treasure journey. This is the journey to eternal life. This is the journey of what it means to be a disciple of God. And, and God, Jesus himself is giving us a roadmap to freedom, to live freely, to experience freedom for eternity. Yes, for that one-time decision that you put your faith in Jesus Christ that no one can ever take you away from it. But also to then live in a freedom daily, through daily surrender, through progressive sanctification, through the power of God and the grace of God for the glory of God. That is freedom. We're going to see that today. Three steps uh, on the, the roadmap of freedom, on the pathway of freedom. 
What does it mean to abide in God's word? Because that's at the core right here. What does it mean to abide? Because abiding in the word of God gives us freedom through God. So what does it mean to abide? What does it mean to experience freedom? The first step is this, know God's truth. We see that vividly in this text. Verse 32. And you will know the truth, and the truth will what? Set you free. So we need to know the truth. The truth is what sets us free. We know that Jesus is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus says in John 14. No one comes to the Father but by who? Me. And Jesus gives us truth through the word, and he gives us the Holy Spirit that will lead us into all truth, as he says in John 14 and 15 in the upper room. And if you are in Christ, you have God the Holy Spirit to lead you into God's truth that will give you freedom each and every day. The question is, are you submitting and surrendering? Are you following and are you obeying? Because that's true freedom. It's not false freedom. Fake freedom is like, I'm free because I got a promotion. Yay. That won't last. You can't take that with you. I'm free because the girl finally went out with me or the guy finally went out with me. Like, that's not freedom. True, ultimate freedom only comes through Jesus Christ. Because this passage is talking about there's something very, very specific. We have to be very careful not to take this text out of context. So often you might hear it on a politician's stump speech or on a, some article or some advertisement somewhere. If you know the truth or some courtroom, the truth will set you free, right? That's not what this text is talking about in terms of some of that other stuff. It's specifically talking about what? Setting us free from the reality of our sin. That is what this text is talking about specifically. We want to apply this text correctly. It's talking about the reality that we are all sinners, that we are all enslaved to sin outside of Jesus Christ, that there is nothing we can do to break us out of our own captivity. It is only through Jesus that he can set us free. Verse 37 and 36. So let's apply it, read it appropriately and apply it correctly, and that is where freedom comes. Now, we see that we can push back on this, and maybe you and I fall more into the religious leader camp than we want to admit, right? Because the religious leaders, Jesus says, he gives them the pathway to freedom. If you abide in my word and truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And the religious leaders in verse 33, they answered, hey, Jesus, you know, we know better than you. That's what they're saying. We're the offspring of Abraham. Who do you think you are, Jesus? How is it, we've never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that, say you, that you're saying that you will become free? Now, they're like, what they're saying is, I don't need to become free because I have never experienced captivity. Now, the religious leaders have a distorted version and vision of history. It's revisionist history on multiple fronts. From the historical, physical level, they have absolutely ancestrally been held in captivity. Egyptians, Babylonians, you want to keep going, right? Read the Old Testament. They absolutely have been in captivity physically. They also know the law. They also know the reality. They have been in captivity spiritually due to their sin, that they can't save themselves. That's what the law points out, the reality that we can't save ourselves, that the, the threshold is perfection, and we can't be perfect, so they institute a sacrificial system because they know that they need a substitute, which is pointing to Jesus. But they're like bathing in ignorance here. They're like, hey, we've never been enslaved to anyone. And Jesus points out to them, he calls their bluff in verse 34, just like he calls your bluff in mine when we go, Jesus, we don't need you, we're good enough, or we're not bad enough, right? That, I'm not an axe murderer, I just, you know, I lie occasionally, I, I'm still going to get into heaven. No, you're not without Jesus. You're held in captivity to your sin, and your sin requires a death penalty. And you and I can't pay for our sins. Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 5.8, Romans but God and his demonstrated his love that when we were sinners, he cried for us. We need to know that's the truth. Know that truth. Because this no word, know the truth that is in the text here, it's not just intellectual information. It's a, a relationally driven closeness and intimacy. I don't just know it intellectually, but in my heart, I have committed, I have surrendered, I have been knit together with Jesus through this truth I've chosen to believe. But Jesus points out the, the hypocrisy and the, and the falling short of the religious leaders. But, you know, he goes here, verse 37. I know that you're the offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. Oh, really? You're not enslaved to sin? Oh, really? You're not enslaved? Yes, you're right. You are the offspring of Abraham. Yet you're literally trying to kill me. By the way, go read the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not what? Kill. 
murder. You're violating them right now. Of course you're a slave to sin. Just like he points out our hypocrisy. Verse 34, truly, truly, I say to you, he's like, amen, amen, pay attention. Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. So who in this room has committed a sin? I have. You know what that means? Everyone who commits a sin, you, you not just haven't commit, you, it's not that you have just committed a sin, you are actively a slave to sin outside of Jesus Christ. We are all in captivity, that this text is teaching us. But look at the beautiful power of the gospel. 36. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This powerful transformation happens. Verse 35, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. What happens when Jesus adopts you is you no longer are a slave to sin, but you are a son of God. Praise God for that. We are all slaves to someone. The question is, who's your master? Because that word slave in this text is bondservant. It means that you are intentionally choosing to lay down your rights to a master. The question is, is your master Satan or is it our Savior? And it's, it gets really weird. No one in their right minds would be like, yeah, my master is Satan. Woo! <laughs> but what is your life saying? Your life speaks so loudly, I can't hear what you say. What's the fruit of your life? Do you know the truth, really? What this text is teaching is that the worst kind of spiritual, the slavery and bondage is one that the prisoner itself doesn't even recognize. These religious leaders cannot see the fact that they are enslaved to sin. And until you acknowledge the reality of your captivity, you will never experience Christ's victory. Will you acknowledge the reality that you are a sinner in need of a Savior, that Jesus is greater, but you, until you see your sin, admit your sin, own your sin, acknowledge your captivity to sin, your helplessness to save yourself, Jesus, you'll never surrender truly to Jesus because you think you don't need Jesus. You think you can save yourself. And you are wrong. I love you. And you will spend eternity separated from God if you continue to believe that without surrendering your heart to Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus is, is teaching here. My, Jesus is saying that your spiritual heritage does not, hear, does not guarantee your, your spiritual citizenship. That you can be born of Abraham. You can go to church all your life. You can be born into a Christian home. You can be able to quote Bible verses like the religious leaders could. You can win sword drills. You can have a perfect attendance, all the gold stars. You can go to Christian camp and throw your CDs back when that was a thing into the fire one night because you had an emotional experience. But without surrender, you will not be adopted into the family of God. It requires choosing to believe. Will you? And it's personal. It's not that your parents did it for you. They can't. Your siblings can't. Your spouse can't. Your friends can't. Your small group leader can't. You must choose, and I pray that you would, because that changes everything. Paul describes this reality in Galatians 4 in a profound way. You'll see it on the screen, Galatians 4, 3 through 7. He says this, in the same way we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, that's at John 1, 14, born of a woman under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might be, receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father, that's personal, that's relational, that's daddy. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Praise God, amen. You aren't just a slave on the outside destined for hell. You've now been saved by Jesus and are now a son of God on the inside and a co-heir with Christ. Full rights. Get to spend eternity together with Jesus in the forever family of God. And when you choose to surrender to Jesus as Lord and Savior and believe that God raised Jesus from the dead after Jesus lived a perfect life and died your death. And praise God for him. From alienated to adopted, forsaken to family. Do you know that truth? personally. Have you believed in that truth? You want freedom? It starts right here. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And if, so, if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed, and no one can ever take that away from you. How do you, what does it mean to know the truth? Easy as ABC, as we say here often. Acknowledge your sin. See your captivity. B, believe that Jesus died on the cross for you. 
that he is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for you. And then third, C, confess Jesus as Lord. Romans 10, 9, and then you will be saved. And if you have any questions about that, we'd love to do that. You can do it right here, right now. We'd love to pray with you afterwards. Pastor Andrew, Don, elders, small group leaders, anybody with a lanyard, like, I pray that you would experience freedom today. And freedom's offered for you today. You just have to choose to believe. Know the truth. That's the truth. And that truth will set you free. Freedom is possible for you because Jesus died for you. He was raised for you and he offers it freely to you. Will you believe? True freedom comes through the complete surrender to the Son of God and the continual submission to the Word of God. The second step on our freedom trail that Jesus is offering us today is this. Anchor your identity in God's truth. Okay, now that we know the truth, we need to anchor our daily identity in it. Because, man, when you go into the office tomorrow on Monday or you get an email on Wednesday or you get a phone call on Thursday, right, you begin to go, do I really know this truth? Am I really going to anchor in it? Am I going to really submit to the word of God? Because I'm tempted, given the context or the circumstances or the uncertain future, to drift from it and to seek my identity in something outside of it or to respond in a way that isn't emblematic of it, meaning I'm not going to respond in a gospel way but a flesh way. And praise God for his grace. We see that this dialogue beginning in verse 38 and going on through 47 where it's all about identity. It's all the question of who is your father? Who is your father? It's almost like Star Wars, Luke, I am your father type thing, right? It's it's a question of identity. 38, I speak of what I've seen my father, Jesus is speaking, what you have heard from your father, this comparison of God and Abraham going on right here, and they answered him, religious leaders, Abraham is our father. Please don't ever replace God with any human being, no matter how amazing they are. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works that Abraham did, but now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You were doing the works of your father, that your father did. They said to him, we are not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. So now they're kind of claiming God is their father. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but God, the father, sent me. So you would obviously believe in me, but now you're trying to kill me. So what gives? Why do you not understand what I say? It's here it is, because you can't bear to hear my word. You see the difference between abiding and rejecting the word of God? And check out the the reality of verse 44. You are of your father, the who? The devil. That's a stark reality. And your will is to do your father's desires. And it goes on, he's a murderer, he's a liar, more on that in a second. But we need, it's a sobering reality, but there is no truth without this, there's no freedom without this truth. You are either a son of God or you are a son of the devil. Which is it? And that's not just a question Jesus is asking the religious leaders here. He's asking you and I here. And we might, none of us, I doubt, maybe, would raise your hand and go, I'm the son of Satan. But read this text. Soberingly, humbly, in reality, and they go examine your life. Because they're like, they're claiming Abraham, then they claim God, and Jesus is going, no, no, no. Your works are displaying your heart. Out of the overflow of your heart, Your mouth speaks, your hands work, you spend your time, your money, your effort. Remember that God had given this promise to Abraham in Genesis 12 that he would make him great in front of all the nations, and it was really the beginning of the Great Commission. One of the sobering realities of this text is that not all the physical seeds of Abraham are going to be spiritual sons of Abraham. (laughs) Paul talks about that in Romans a lot, chapter 9 and others. What makes you a spiritual son of Abraham? Belief in God. Praise God that as Jesus describes in verse 42, God sent Jesus to make a way for us. It's the gospel, the heart of the gospel. It's available for all of us, but requires belief and faith from all of us. The pathway to freedom comes comes from anchoring your identity in the right father. Do you want to be free? Answer honestly right now, who's your daddy? Who's your father? Because who your daddy is, defines where your destination is going to be in in, in eternity. And we have to face the reality. Now, we know Satan's a liar. He's a false accuser. He's a deceiver. He's a slanderer. And he doesn't always drop an anvil on our heads, Looney Tunes styles to get us. But he whispers things into our minds like, you're good enough. 
Well, we know that from Genesis 3. Did God really say that you shouldn't eat from the tree of good and evil, he said to eat? So he, he softens us up with like this appetizer to our, our flesh. And then he goes in for the kill. You can eat this, you won't surely die, which is in direct contradiction to Genesis 2 when God says, if you eat this, you will die. And so like, I'm not saying we're sitting here going like, we're going to live for Satan today. We're going to live for the devil. But if you're not living for God's word, guess who you're living for? Like, that's what this text is saying. If you're not abiding in God's word, but are actively rejected, you can't bear to hear it. You're like a little toddler. Yeah, God, no, 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 no. I know you say I shouldn't sleep with anybody not my, not I'm married to, but no, 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 no. I'm going to do it my way anyway. Come on. You can't bear to hear the truth of God's word about how you should spend your money, what you should do with your time. How many of us are like, I can't hear you, so it doesn't apply to me, to God? So how do we know which, who, who our father is? Well, pretend like you're logging on to Ancestry.com today, and let's have a spiritual paternity test from this text. Who are you really following? And again, it goes back to, are you abiding in the word of God? Or are you rejecting the word of God? It goes back to, are you surrendering to Jesus? And are you the son of God? And are you submitting to the word of God or not? Here's a spiritual paternity test from us, because this text is all about who your father is, the right father. These guys were confused. They were claiming one thing, and reality was very, very different. However, they were claiming religion and not relationship. You can't be saved through religion, friends. Spiritual paternity test, the first question we should ask ourselves is this, do I genuinely love Jesus? Verse 42, Jesus himself says that, right? If God were your father, what's the next four words? You would what? Love me. <laughs> so simple yet profound, do you love Jesus? I didn't ask if you like Jesus. I didn't ask if Jesus is a nice guy and he does nice, no, love, love. Worship, revere, elevate. When, I, my, when what I want to do conflicts with what God's word wants to do, I elevate God's word and I do it God's way. I live to worship. I live to sacrifice. I live to serve. Is that you, genuinely, seeking to emulate Jesus' way? Because Jesus himself said in John 14, if you love me, then you'll do what? Obey my commands. So if you love Jesus, are you submitting under the authority of God's word, are you surrendering to Jesus? Are you abiding? Because that's freedom. If you love me, you will obey me. When you don't understand it, when you don't like it, when you can't see it, you're going to trust me because you love me. Because you're surrendered to me. Friends, are you genuinely loving Jesus today? Second question is this. Is, am I hearing or am I rejecting the word of God? You go down to 46 and 47, Jesus says, which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell you the truth, why do you not believe in me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason that you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Whoever is of God does what? Hears the words of God. You're approaching the word of God with a humble pos posture to keep listening, to keep learning, to keep seeking, to be silent and to let God speak. You're not going into God's word for validation of what you want to do. You're going with the humble posture with an open heart saying, God, what do you want me to do? You're going into God's word saying, Holy Spirit, pray, pray this every time you go into God's word this week. You need to start with going into God's word, right? Open the eyes of my heart to see you. Open the, the thoughts in my mind to hear you. Open the hands that you have given me to obey you and lead me. Surrender and submission, is my heart submitted? Is my head submitted? Are my hands submitted? All of them. We want to be people of the word, that stay in the word, that apply the word and obey the word because we are surrendered to Jesus Christ and we are submitted to the word of God. We, we won't want to go in to the text was something like I said, Jesus said, basically says, I want confirmation bias. I want some verse somewhere that gives me the right to do what I want and stamp it on something and I feel better about myself. No, we want to go into God's truth and pull out its truth. Humble ourselves before it. Listen. 
hear. Hear the Spirit lead us into his truth. Quiet our hearts. Lay everything on the table. Open hands, open minds. Not rationalizing or justifying it to do it our way with hearts of love and surrender. They go, God, I genuinely want to do it your way. Lead me and guide me. And then give me the strength to apply it. Give me the strength to obey. Because that's the distinct that Jesus is making. If you're of God, if God's your father, you'll hear the words. 46, if you're not of God, you're not going to believe him. You're going to reject him. And you go back up to 43. You cannot bear to hear my words. Like you've shut your mind off to the word of God. You're like, I'm, I'm dead set on doing it my way and I don't care what the word says. I don't care what the spirit says. I pray that God's going to bless me along the way, right? How many of our prayer life and personal walk with the Lord is actually like that if we're really, really, really real? God, I'm going to do it, but please bless me in it. We don't even actually stop to hear the Spirit or hear the Word. And is that you? Because we're focused on fleshly, earthly, sufficient things and not God. We're not trusting God to see us through what He wants us to do. And as He convicts us, may we forgive. When we seek His forgiveness, His grace is abounding. And may we go back to His work. Trust Him and look back to Him. He will take you back in a heartbeat. <laughs> Humble, forgive, repent. Third question, is my will to do God's desires or the devil's? I mean, verse 44, is, it's scary and it's clear. You are of the, your father, the devil, and your will is to do what? Your father's desires. Your, your will is to do the devil's desires. Jesus himself, multiple times in, in, in Luke and, and other places, Mark, says, out of the overflow of the heart, the what? The mouth speaks. So you're going to do in your life where you're, you're committed in your heart to. So if you're committed to the devil, you're going to live, do the devil's works. That's what he's literally saying to the religious leaders here. And he's saying to you and I today too. So let me ask you this. When you get that, when you, when you, you experience something in your life and your fingers are typing a text message or an email, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. As you're responding to a, a, something that happened or happened to you, are you doing God's way or your way or flesh's way or even Satan's way, a non-biblical way. When you're in your parenting decisions, in your relationship decisions, your way or God's way, how you're spending your money, your way or God's way, how do you respond when you're sinned against, your way or God's way. Fourth question is, am I full of God's truth or the devil's lies? We see this, that Satan is he's a liar. He's not just a liar, he is the father of lies. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar. We know the truth, and the truth will set us free. The truth will set us free from Satan's lies. We know that in God, we have been adopted as sons, as this, te this text is teaching us. We know that Satan wants to lie to us. My question is, will you anchor in the truth? Are you anchoring in the truth today? Or are you allowing Satan's lies to permeate your hearts and your minds? He might lie to you like this, like, you're just an alcoholic. No, you're not. You're more than that. You are one that was bought with a price. You're just a liar. It doesn't have to, your past doesn't have to define you. You're just a cheater. You're just an adulterer. All those identity things. And then we go, paid in full, paid in full, paid in full, that Jesus took it on his account and covered us with his grace. But we have to choose to anchor in that when Satan comes at us and attacks us with these things. Or he might go, you have no choice but to go back to that stronghold of sin. Yes, you do. You have been bought and paid for and set free. The shackles of sin that once bound you have been broken. Some of us in this room are choosing to remain in sin but that's your choice. And the calling of God and the calling of this text and the calling of his word and the Holy Spirit is to leave those sinful patterns behind because you have a new father, you have a new master, the old is gone, the new has come. Walk that way. You don't believe me? Let's see what Paul says about this as we anchor our identity in God's truth and not Satan's lies. Paul says this in Romans 6. We were buried, therefore, with him, Jesus, by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. 
For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self, the old ways, the liar, the adulterer, the addict, was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set, what? Free from sin. That's Easter. That's the resurrection that we have today. It's dead. It's done. It's gone. That's the truth of the gospel. Now, here's the exhortation. Let not sin reign, therefore, in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. You have a choice, friends. You don't have to keep keep going back to the bottle or the internet screen or that unhealthy relationship. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness, for sin will have no dominion, no power over you since you are not under the law, but under the grace of God. Praise God. Amen. You see this beautiful reality that this is the truth of the gospel. This is not the lives of Satan. God's truth is that no longer should you stop doing what was sinful, but you should start doing what is righteous. There is a better purpose that you go, God has given you gifts to be used as instruments of his righteousness to build and expand his kingdom. So stop dilly-dallying in things that are binding you and strongholds for you. And by the grace of God, tell them what Jesus did for you, that you are no longer Satan's, but you are God's, and choose a different way to live God's way, which is the best way. That's what Paul is saying, that you have a choice because you're not under the law, you're under grace. John Owen says, be killing sin or or it will be killing you. Where do you need to make that choice today? Your shackles are broken. Stop staying in the stronghold. And I know that lifelong patterns have things. We're here to walk with you. But you need to choose that you're willing to walk that path. It will be hard. There will be potholes. You'll sprain your ankle. You'll need to pit stop. Get back on the path by the grace of God, through the strength of God. Embrace biblical community and choose that you want to surrender continually and continue to submit to the word of God because it's best for you. And you have a new master who is God. And it's his power. It's his strength. It's not just willpower. It's anchoring in the grace of God, embracing the life of God that he has for you to be used as instruments of the righteousness of God. Praise God for that. Where do you need to do that today? Because third and finally today, the third step that we have today as we walk in Jesus' freedom trail that he's laying out for us in this text is this. Not only are we set free by knowing the truth and anchoring our identity in God's truth, but we need to keep God's truth. Because Jesus answered, the, the Jews answered Jesus after he, he sort of calls them out. And they said, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? And don't gloss over this. You know what they are doing when they call him a Samaritan? That is the worst race, racist slur that they could use. So what do you do when someone attacks you with a racial slur? When someone offends you for speaking God's truth? Jesus tells us this. Keep in the word. Jesus answered, I don't have a demon, but I honor my father. What do we do when someone comes at us like that? Honor your father. You dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is a judge. Anchor in verse 51, friends. Highlighted, underline it. Is what hope this is. What freeing hope. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone what? Keeps my word. They will what? He will never see death. Never see death. Death. You want to know what ultimate freedom is? Our promised eternity. Our freedom is not in anything earthly. It's in the eternal life that comes through believing in Jesus. That is, we keep the word of God. Now again, obedience doesn't earn us salvation. That's not what Jesus is saying. But obedience to God is a demonstration of our salvation. There's a big difference there. We are only saved by grace through faith. But we are saved to do God's work. And the only way to do God's work is to keep in God's word. Get in the word, stay in the word, keep in the word, abide in the word. You want to know why we love God's word here? Read this text over and over and over because it's our source of freedom. Where do you need to stay in the word? Maybe you've drifted from it. In the face of opposition, stay in the word. Surrender to Jesus and trust in his power. 
The Jews come back at him. Now we know you have a demon, 52, and Abraham died as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he'll never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? They look at Jesus and go, who do you think you are? And it's at this point that I'm like, where's my popcorn? It's about to get good. Jesus is like, really? You want to go there? You can't handle this truth, religious leaders. You think you can? You want this answer? Okay, I'll give you this answer. You want to know the truth? Here it comes. I hope you choose to anchor in it because you're not going to like it. Jesus answered 54, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It's my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. You claim to be God's kids, sons, but you don't know him. They called him out. You don't know him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. Truth hurts, doesn't it? But we need to hear the truth, that we are liars, that we are sinners in need of a Savior before we can experience the truth of God's grace. But I do know him, and I I keep his word, unlike you. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see me in my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you're not 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham. They're like, Abraham's like, oh, way old by now. (laughs) Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. I am. So they picked up stones to throw him, but Jesus himself went out to the temple. Why did they want to stone him? Because when he drops the I am, he's exclaiming with exclusivity his divinity. It's the most direct claim to his divinity that Jesus can make. Ego emi, as Pastor Andrew said a couple weeks ago. Direct connection back to Exodus 3, when Exodus and Moses and burning bush and God's like, Moses, go. And and Moses is like, I can't, I won't. You have no idea what they've done to me. I killed someone, they're after me. And how will the people know that I am with you, the Jewish people? And God says, tell them that I am who I am sent you. So my friends, my question to you is this, will you keep the word? The word keep means to observe the word, to remain in the word. When there was spiritual opposition like Jesus faced, he kept the word. He kept in the truth. Will you keep in the truth this week of God's word? Will you allow it to drive your actions when opposition comes your way? When you have to make a difficult decision, will you keep in the truth and do it God's way and not your way? When it costs you something this week, will you keep in the word? Will you obey the word? Will you surrender and submit to the word? Because that is true freedom. Satan's lies are, it's not free if you have, it's just binding if you actually obey the word. No, 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 the word is freedom. But will you do it? Because when you trace out freedom all throughout the Bible, and you look at all these people that we consider heroes of the faith, read Hebrews 11. Abram, go. Where? I'm not telling you yet, just go. Will you keep your word, the word when God says you to do something without giving you a final destination? David, go, conf- go. you're going to be the next king. I'm just a wee little shepherd boy. Trust me. Okay. Face Goliath. Okay. Gideon, go confront these soldiers, but I'm just the least of the least in the clan. I just want to stay hidden in the cave, and maybe that's you. And God's calling you to step out. Keep the word. Trust. Because we don't just want to keep the imperatives, which are the instructions that we must obey. We want to keep in the indicatives, which is who God is, right? That God is faithful, that God is good, that God is greater, that he is worthy. And we anchor in those and we rest in those and then we abide in the indicatives and that gives us strength to do the imperatives. Each and every day. Remember that God is the great I am, that Jesus is the great I am. I am the one, Jesus says, who created you. I am the one that was sent to die for you. I am the one that was killed in your place and was risen on the third day for you. I am the one that offers salvation freely for you. I am the one that generates a pathway of of freedom for you. Will you believe? So friends, the pathway to freedom has been laid out for you today. The question is, do you want to be free? Do you know the truth? Will you anchor in the truth? And will you keep in the truth? Because that's your pathway to freedom. Your choice is yours. Jesus has given you the roadmap. What is your next step today? What is your next step? Father, we love you. And we're just so thankful for you. We're so thankful for the reality that we can keep in your word because you kept your word. 
that you sent a Savior, Jesus, who took our place when we were bound in the captivity of our sin. And we could not save ourselves. You kept your word to send a Messiah. You kept your word to pay the price personally for our sin and to create a way for us to live with you forever in eternity as you allowed your son to be brutally murdered on the cross of Calvary. And then you raised him from the dead, defeating sin and death, giving us hope and life that we can walk in today and every day. And Jesus, help us to know that truth. Help us to anchor our identity in that truth and help us to choose to keep in that truth, in your word. Help us to choose to surrender completely, to submit continually to the reality of who you are, to abide in your word and allow your word to be the light unto our feet and the lamp unto our path as we walk in your grace, through your power, for your glory, to be instruments of righteousness, to shed your light to a world around us that is in desperate need of it. Jesus, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. be close, close to your side, so heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above, singing as one,
Amen. Praise God that he is the great I am. Amen. Will you walk confidently and will you choose to walk freely as you abide in God's word faithfully this week and every week? Harvest, may you walk in that beautiful truth that Jesus has set you free and where the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. Know that you are loved and that you are sent for the glory of God. Have a great week. Mm-hmm.